somebody once said, Richard Foster said, prayer is the central avenue God uses to transform us. He transformed us. You see, many times when we pray, you know, we think that we could change the mind of God in our prayer, right? But based on my experience, based on my experience, prayer is the time when God changes us. God changes us. If you keep spending your time to Him, you are going to be the one to be transformed. The more you understand what prayer is, the more you would desire to really pray some more. You know, once you understand what prayer is all about, that's really spending time with the most important person in your life, which is Jesus, it will change you. Your approach to prayer will never be the same. You will long to pray when you fully understand and realize what really prayer is. If you really commit, if you really say, if you really believe that Jesus is not just one of the persons, but, one of, but, but really the most important person in your life, He is your Lord, He is your Master, He is your Creator, He is your Savior. If He is that truly in your life, then you would want to spend more time in prayer. You know, one of the most important critical aspect of how to really pray according to how scriptures is telling us is really to have the right heart in praying. Let me repeat that. It's about the heart, the motivation why you're praying to the Lord. The principle is what is in the heart is what should really matters most. And so one way for us to really have the right heart in towards prayer is to pray not to impress but to really pray because you want to spend time with the Lord but the best way to pray is really from having the right heart and what is that right heart is to seek the Lord to be in his presence to communicate to him to tell him to talk to him to listen to him
somebody once said, Richard Foster said, prayer is the central avenue God uses to transform us. He transformed us. You see, many times when we pray, you know, we think that we could change the mind of God in our prayer, right? But based on my experience, based on my experience, prayer is the time when God changes us. God changes us. If you keep spending your time to Him, you are going to be the one to be transformed. The more you understand what prayer is, the more you would desire to really pray some more. You know, once you understand what prayer is all about, that's really spending time with the most important person in your life, which is Jesus, it will change you. Your approach to prayer will never be the same. You will long to pray when you fully understand and realize what really prayer is. If you really commit, if you really say, if you really believe that Jesus is not just one of the persons, but, one of, but, but really the most important person in your life, He is your Lord, He is your Master, He is your Creator, He is your Savior. If He is that truly in your life, then you would want to spend more time in prayer. You know, one of the most important critical aspect of how to really pray according to how scriptures is telling us is really to have the right heart in praying. Let me repeat that. It's about the heart, the motivation why you're praying to the Lord. The principle is what is in the heart is what should really matters most. It's a one way for us to really have the right heart in towards prayer is to pray not to impress but to really pray because you want to spend time with the Lord. But the best way to pray is really from having the right heart. And what is that right heart? Is to seek the Lord, to be in His presence, to communicate to Him, to tell Him, to talk to Him, to listen to Him.
somebody once said, Richard Foster said, prayer is the central avenue God uses to transform us. He transformed us. You see, many times when we pray, you know, we think that we could change the mind of God in our prayer, right? But based on my experience, based on my experience, prayer is the time when God changes us. God changes us. If you keep spending your time to Him, you are going to be the one to be transformed. The more you understand what prayer is, the more you would desire to really pray some more. You know, once you understand what prayer is all about, that's really spending time with the most important person in your life, which is Jesus, it will change you. Your approach to prayer will never be the same. You will long to pray when you fully understand and realize what really prayer is. If you really commit, if you really say, if you really believe that Jesus is not just one of the persons, but, one of, but, but really the most important person in your life, He is your Lord, He is your Master, He is your Creator, He is your Savior. If He is that truly in your life, then you would want to spend more time in prayer. Hello singles and welcome to another edition of Big Fridays. I am Pastor Ikoy and I want to welcome you all to Big Fridays online. Um, I know some of you are uh, joining us from different parts of Metro Manila, even different parts of Luzon, even in Visayas and Mindanao, and also those that are joining outside the Philippines. Oh wow, what an encouragement knowing that the different big singles uh, ministry, different satellites are gathered together this evening to join us in our Big Friday session. Welcome to Big Fridays. But especially, we want to welcome those of you that might be joining us for the very first time. Well, Big Fridays, just for those of you that probably new to this, it's a gathering of singles from different parts of the world where we converge on a Friday night, and for some it's a Saturday, or for some it's a Sunday. Uh, depends on what day your satellites are viewing this. But it's a gathering of singles whose desire is to provide purpose and meaning in their perpetually busy lives. Our sessions are always grounded on God's Word. It's His Word that fuels us. It's His Word that we meditate on. It's His Word that we talk about. And we know that His Word, His promises, His character is the same and is constant. And that's why this evening um, we're excited that we're unveiling a new series called The Promise Keeper. Promise Keeper. Promise Keeper is about seeking the one who always fulfills 
these promises. And so we're excited that uh, you will be able to join us, hopefully, in the next couple of Fridays. This is four sessions that we'll talk about this amazing verse in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Let me read it to you. Jeremiah verse 29, verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. I'm sure most of you have read that verse, heard that verse, or even meditated on that verse for so many, for so many times. But more often than not, um, that verse packs more punch than we see from the onset. And that's why the next couple of Fridays, we will really talk about that. And we are hoping and praying that you will be joining us. Also, right after this session, uh, we will be able to grow into breakout sessions. One of the amazing things that we're being reminded of is this ability to discuss whatever have been, dis have been shared uh, on the message. One of the ways that that we uh, realized for these messages to really be personalized, for these messages to be amplified in our personal lives, it, is, it needs to be processed. And so we're inviting you. Right after the message of our speaker for tonight, we'd like to invite you to a breakout session. There are multiple breakouts happening all over, uh, especially uh, online. But if you want to be part of, of those breakout sessions, just please comment in the comment section below and then we have our volunteers who could go to you and plug you in these uh, breakout sessions it's important and we'd like to really invite you that it's nice to discuss these messages with other singles who whose desires also to to you know to to process uh, the message with other people with other people who have heard the message as well so tonight uh, as always um we will start off with a praise and worship uh song and then we're gonna usher in. We're gonna introduce to you our speaker for tonight. Our speaker for tonight is a is someone who is very close to the heart of the singles. He he is part of the singles ministry. He started the singles ministry, but now as he went into full time ministry, he has branched into a new ministry that the Lord has called him. He's now leading the men's movement. The movement is the all men's ministry of CCF, and he is uh, in the forefront of ensuring that we develop the right kind of male leadership. Our speaker, together with his wife, have partnered together uh, uh, in, this, in, in, in the full-time calling in, in CCF, and we're really just blessed on how this, this, this fellow servant, this leader, have really emerged in a way that the Lord is using to impact people's lives. So praise God for our speaker, who is going to be Mike Yap. But before we, before we bring in Mike Yap, I want to introduce to you uh, and I want to invite you to a time of singing, worshiping the Lord so we can repair our hearts. We brought together two of our servants, one from Big Tokyo and one from Big Fridays in CCF Maine to lead us in our praise and worship tonight. Let's all sing this song. Hello, Big. So I'm from Big Tokyo and it's a wonderful privilege to serve with you guys in spirit and in truth. Let's sing this song. The splendor of the King God in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps That is voice, how great, how great is our God. See with me how great is our God. And oh, you see how great, how great is our God. Amen. H to H, come on, church, let's all sing. H to H, he stands. Amen. And time is in his hands. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. The Godhead. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit, and Son. 
Good day, friends. Um, it is my privilege to just speak this message to you today uh, here in Big Fridays. Um, I know it's a special week that we have this week. It's the Holy Week, so it's, it's a time to really um, gather together and reflect on what God has done for us and how we can respond to Him, right? Um, if you have been uh, in the news and you've been aware of our recent predicament, um, it looks not too good, right? You've probably come across these words like a pandemic, um, the, the global health crisis that has been plaguing our world, not just um, one country or two, but the entire world, all of the nations, all of the people who are currently suffering through this virus. And uh, if you're anything like me, you tend to overthink. Um, you tend to really ponder and think about how will this pandemic pan out right how will uh, we see the end of this virus as it subsides as um, we we try to cope with our current situation and hope and pray to god that there will be a resolution uh, and, and and that the virus will just uh, come to an end or maybe there's a vaccine that we're waiting for and so in, in light of the pandemic that we've been um, facing recently, uh, I know many of you have also thought of this, right? How about our plans? Um, all of the plans that we've crafted for 2020, um, not just our personal plans, maybe plans to travel, but also plans for our career, um, for our you know, work, and even for our families our loved ones, our relationships, our friendships, and we just, uh, in a matter of a few days and weeks, all of those plans were overturned. And if you're like me, I'm thinking and I'm wondering now, what's going to happen with all of these plans? Uh, amidst this pandemic, what, what, what's going to happen to my life, right? I know some of you are, are currently knowing people who have been afflicted with the virus or complications in their health, and you're thinking, Man, what's our plan now? How do we go about this? How do we just manage all of these these problems that we're facing? And some of you, you might be facing the brunt of that work or the lack of work right now and the lack of your livelihood for yourself. And, and so you're worrying about all of these plans. And so when we are worried, when there is a global pandemic happening, when we are bombarded with so many problems, Man, we have to turn to the Word of God, right? In the Bible, in the Scriptures, as our guide, as our help in times of need, and as a way for us to navigate through these difficult and challenging times that we are in right now. And one of the verses that you probably might have read um, during this whole quarantine lockdown season uh, is the verse that I'm about to share with you. Um, it's a very beautiful verse. It's a very widely used verse. And somehow we gain comfort from this verse. And it is called Jeremiah 29, 11. Now I'm sure you've read this. And why don't we read it all together right now. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. You see, here at Big Fridays, for the next few weeks, we're going to start a, an entire series on this one verse alone. And we pray that as we go through this verse, that we will let, learn um, the significance of it for our current lockdown quarantine season. That in the midst of this pandemic, we can actually hope that God's purpose will be fulfilled and that He still has a plan for us. Now, um, I do want to challenge uh, all of us right now as we start this first session of our series entitled promise keeper the promise keeper um, that this verse is very popular uh, it is very widely used uh, it is very you know uh, if you ask any regular person even though they're not a christian they might have probably gone through this verse read it somewhere probably on Maybe Instagram, like you have this Instagrammable post, right, for good vibes. Um, and and you, like, you see a lot of people liking it, commenting it. Yes, amen. I know that God has a good plan for my life and all of this. And, and if we're not careful, 
we can reduce our faith, our understanding, our theology based on Instagram or on Google where we have tidbits of Bible verses that we use for ourselves without even getting into the detail, getting into the context of what the verse is actually trying to say. What I mean by this is that we can develop an Instagram theology, we can develop a YouTube theology without even considering what the Word of God says in the Bible. So many of us will see Jeremiah 29, 11 in the lens of Instagram in this very nice picturesque poster of a post. But let me show you a dose of reality right now. The actual setting of Jeremiah 29, 11 would look something more like this. You see, when you look at the reality of where Jeremiah 29, that whole chapter is written in the context of what setting it is written and it is being written to, man, you will see that it is a devastating time in the time of the nation of Israel. You see, the whole chapter and that verse that we're going to study, Jeremiah 29, 11, is written in the context of destruction, of mayhem, of death, of all of these things that are happening to the nation of Israel during that time. And you might be wondering, oh my God, goodness, how do we go about this? It's a very wonderful verse. But then when we understand the context more, when we actually dive down into this verse, we will see its very, very real significance, not just for them back then, but for us Christians right now. So the last thing that I want to do in this series is you know, to, to just leave you as is with Jeremiah 29, 11 and saying that, you know, I love that verse, but I want to leave you with an understanding behind it as we go through this first session. And you know, I remember as a young Christian, I love that verse. I, it applied to me. You mean, God has a purpose, God has a plan for me, not for my harm, but for my welfare, and, and that God is actually, you know, out for my, my, my best interests, I'll take it, right? And, and that's how many of us uh, initially approach this verse. But, you know, I want to encourage us all, um, when, when Jeremiah, the author of this, this book, Jeremiah, we call him the weeping prophet. Why is he the weeping prophet? because he has been called by God to deliver and proclaim a message of judgment. You understand that? And not only that, he was called to thwart many false prophets, people who have wrong messages, erroneous messages, misleading messages from God, people who are claiming to speak on behalf of God. And that is what God is actually not trying to tell his people. That's the context in which Jeremiah the prophet is. But at the end of it all, despite the message of judgment, of false prophets, false messages, Jeremiah is called to proclaim and provide a message of hope and restoration. So that is my plan as we go through this message today, that we will indeed have, in the midst of the context of this verse, a true and real hope that we can get from this verse as we study it. Why don't I start us in the word of prayer right now? Father God, I thank you that we have this chance right now amidst our community quarantine that we can still gather together and learn from your word. And today as we embark on a new series, O Lord, we discover that you, our God, our Lord, you are a promise keeper. That despite of all of our shortcomings, despite of all of our lack despite of all of our weaknesses our failures and even our sin that you are still there faithful keeping your promises and now lord even in the midst of this pandemic we pray father that you will reveal your plans for us that indeed you have plans that you want to fulfill in our lives and we realize today that these plans are far above and beyond what we can imagine so lord i pray that all of us now would seek you, that your Holy Spirit would just teach us understanding and that all of the viewers who are tuning into this message will really be blessed, 
would be inspired, maybe called to repentance, and that you will lead us, Lord, to believe and trust in you, our God, the promise keeper. We now commit this time to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone say, Amen. So, to begin our message today, I just want to set the context straight. Jeremiah, the prophet, is writing these words down to the people who are in Babylon. Now, if you know a background about the Babylonian Empire, they are a world superpower in the 6th to 7th century BC. This will show you the extent of their empire all across the Mediterranean, um, all across the Saharan Desert. So they were a large superpower that came to rise after the Assyrian Kingdom. Now, you got to know about uh, the Babylonians. They were ruthless. They were really out to conquer the entire world. And they were invading all these nations and all of these kingdoms. And, and so it, when they come around to Judah or the nation of Israel during around 6th century BC, Man, you have to put yourself in the shoes of these people, all right? You have to see that, man, these guys, they have seen world kingdoms um, conquer uh, the northern part of Israel. And then now they are facing impending invasion from Babylon. And after that invasion took place, the history books tell us that the Babylonians uh, took the Israelites captive. And then what did they do? They did not just let them remain in their land, but they took them out. They deported them to another place and they placed them in Babylon. Now, if you were in the shoes of the Israelites, what would you feel? Um, that's roughly five to six months travel away from Israel. And that would probably roughly take about 900 miles or 1,500 kilometers away from your homeland. And now you are in this foreign land. You don't know what to do. And so you're going to think, right? Are the promises of God still valid for us? Right? God told us that we are His chosen people, that we, uh, we will have this promised land, the land of Canaan, right? We, that we will be His people, that we will be a light unto the nations. And yet right now we are in exile. How can God allow such a thing to happen? Right? If we just think about it really uh, in, in their shoes, you're, you're going to be doubting God's promises. You're going to be doubting all of his words. You know, you're going to be asking questions like, how can God allow such a thing to occur in our time? But I want to encourage you guys with the main message for today. Will God still be faithful to his promises even in exile? Will he keep Jeremiah 29, 11 to his people? Well, the answer is yes, because our main message for today is this, that God is our promise keeper, right? There is no other being or no other person who can keep his promises 100% of the time. And because he is our promise keeper, our response is we need to be faithful in exile. You see, this message is so relevant to us because in some way, we too are right now um, in exile. We are uh, far from living our normal routines. Uh, we are taken away or displaced from our places of work, our normal day-to-day -day activities, and we are somewhat exiled in our own homes. And so when we see God as our promise keeper, that even in the midst of this difficult uh, situation that we are in, we can still respond in faith and we can be faithful in exile so with that repeat after me the message for today is that god is what he is our promise keeper and in response we need to what be faithful in exile now what does it mean to be faithful in exile i've created four simple points that will carry us through the context of jeremiah chapter 29 and the first is this we have to check our frame of mind we have to see and check our frame of mind. Everyone repeat after me. Point number one, frame of mind. Number two is we have to flourish in Babylon. Can you repeat after me? Number two is we need to what? Flourish in Babylon. And number three, 
we do not need to believe the fake news. Everyone say fake news. And point number four is that we can experience God's fulfilled promises. These are my four simple points today to help us, to encourage us to be faithful while in exile. Now again, as we go back to Jeremiah chapter 29, let's go all the way back to verse 1. This is how the chapter starts. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah, the prophet, sent from Jerusalem to the surviving people in, in Babylon. These are the elders, uh, the priests, the prophets, and all the people who were gathered together, deported to Babylon. Okay. In other words, the prophet Jeremiah was writing from Jerusalem. He got left behind. And he was given a message from God to say to the people who are in exile. Okay? Um, history tells us that Jeremiah eventually moved down to Egypt where he continued and wrote the book of Lamentations. Okay? So he was uh, separated from the, the people who were called into exile in Babylon. And look at this. He writes, Whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, this is important to remember. The king of Babylon during that time was Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? Um, this is a ruthless king. Uh, this is a wicked king. This is a king who has all the world at his beckon, at his call. He has all the power in the world. And uh, you'll see this character, Nebuchadnezzar, in great detail, even in the book of Daniel. Right? Daniel, uh, we remember him, the faithful Israelite who served under Nebuchadnezzar and we see a lot of Nebuchadnezzar there how he is deep into the, the magical occult uh, how he is into all of these uh, very uh, very eccentric ways of domineering or dominating people and ruling over the land so this Nebuchadnezzar was the one who had taken the people of Israel into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, if you are in exile, that is a, 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 a difficult situation to be in, right? Um, you would have been displaced from your hometown. You would have been carried to another town. And you would have been, you know, treated poorly. You would have been treated and despised as an enemy, as a, a POW or a prisoner of war. You've been exiled. And so we can, we can learn a thing or two from the Israelites during this time of exile. In fact, they're going to be there for a very, very long time. The next verses share to us how the Babylonians conducted their exile or their uh, deportation strategy, right? In verse 2, uh, Jeremiah writes, This was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem and the letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Jemariah, the son of Hilkiah, from Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So what's happening here? Well, like I mentioned earlier in the message, um, at that time, the nation of Israel was actually split into two. Right, uh, A few years before, the northern kingdom called Israel was invaded by another world power before the Babylonians. This was the Assyrians and they invaded the northern kingdom. And what the Assyrians did was they totally dispersed the northern Israelites. What did they do? They were into cultural disintegration. They destroyed the culture. And they dispersed the people. They took all of these northern Israelites. They dispersed them all across the land so that their bloodline would be lost forever. Their culture diminished. They don't have a sense of personal identity. The Babylonians, on the other hand, this is what they did. They did cultural assimilation. What did that entail? When they invaded a nation, they would take the chief of the people. They would take the royal uh, the royal bloodlines, they would take the officials, they would take the professionals, the craftsmen, the workers, all of the cream of the crop, the top of the top. Okay? They would take these people, deport them to Babylon, okay? and what they would do in Babylon 
was to enculturize, okay, enculturate all of the people so that after a period, these people would then be sent back to their land and they would no longer have their identity as their former nation. But they would be enculturated in the, in the life and the style of the Babylonian culture. So that's how they tweak their invasion policy, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, versus Assyria. And so this is what's happening here. They're taking all of these people, deporting them to Babylon to, you know, enculturate them, maybe brainwash them, maybe train them in a new way of thinking, enculturate them with their language, with their, with their culture, with their religion, with all of these ways of uh, government and leadership. And that's essentially what we also see happening in the book of Daniel, right? Daniel and his friends, they were supposed to live in a certain way, but they respectfully resisted and God was faithful to keep them. And so look at this. I want to go to the next verse and see something and notice something very, very peculiar. In verse 4, the letter said, Thus says the Lord of hosts. This is another way of calling God. The Lord of hosts or the Lord of all of the nations. The Lord of the heavenly abode. Right? The God of Israel to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Well, wait a minute, Mike. Earlier in verse 1, we just saw that it was Nebuchadnezzar who carried out these exiles to Babylon. But here, the Lord is saying, to all the exiles whom I have sent. You see, we need to discover our frame of mind when dealing with situations, when dealing with all of these circumstances that we are faced. That ultimately, everything happens by permission of God. Let me repeat that. Everything that happens in our lives and in the life of the world and in the life of our nation is there because it is permitted by God. In other words, for the exiles, hey, it was Nebuchadnezzar who conquered our land destroyed our land and now he deported us to Babylon but all of that was allowed and permitted by God himself in theology we call this the providence of God how God orchestrates absolutely everything in human affairs that he is in the background although we cannot see everything but he is interlacing everything he is orchestrating everything to work together for his purposes and if you ask me that's something very very amazing that only God who is in control can do so what this verse tells us now is that our frame of mind must be clarified our perspective about the things that happen in our lives should be seen through the lens of God's providence that we see him at work that he has a purpose that he wants to unveil and wants to fulfill in our lives and even in the midst of this difficult circumstance, right? In the exile, the Israelites must know through the, the prophet Jeremiah and his words that God, I, the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts, allowed these things to happen upon you guys. And so that leads me to think right now, how about you? How are you taking in this current pandemic situation? How are you taking in with all the problems that we are currently facing in this quarantine period? right if you do not look at these things from the providence of god from his sovereign you know orchestration of everything you will be lost your perspective will be skewed you will think and despair that oh no god has left us when in fact god has not left us and god has a purpose that he wants to fulfill even in this current situation and that's how we can relate to these israelites who were exiled that we need to fix our frame of mind. We need to clarify how do we respond to these things. In fact, as I was thinking about this, um, during this, this whole community lockdown, man, people are stuck in their homes. Uh, they're stuck with nothing else to do but to really spend time with their loved ones. You see, some of us, we don't realize that even this situation right now was brought about by God to bring about something good. Like for me personally, um, this, this whole time of quarantine has just been a time of reflection, a time for prayer, and, and, and even answered prayer in more time to rest, 
more time to spend with my wife, with your loved ones, right? And, and more time to really commune with God. And so when you have a right frame of mind, when you have the right perspective to deal with these situations that you are faced with, man, you will see God is working, that He permitted this for a purpose. Now, as we move on to the next part of our message, look at this. This is what God wants to tell the people through Jeremiah. He says in verse 5, Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. What is he what what in the world is he talking about? We're in exile. And you know what? If you were a regular person during that time, you know, you would you you would anticipate God telling you to resist, right? Or rebel against these foreign invaders, right? Go against them, right? But instead, this is what God tells them. Build houses, live in them, plant gardens, and eat their produce. In other words, continue living even in the midst of the exile. And in verse 6, look, take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. Oh, for some of you singles, this is your life verse. Yes, take wives, take marriage, right? But for their context, wow, God is even telling us that even in the midst of our exile, that we are to bear sons and daughters and to multiply and do not decrease. Wow, God is telling them to continue in their family lines, in their marriages, so that they can continue to produce their offspring and continue their bloodline, continue their nation. That is so counterintuitive as to what you would think to do during an exile, right? And he doesn't stop there. In verse 7, I love these words. Jeremiah 29, 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. You see what God is telling these exiles in Babylon is this. You need to thrive. You cannot merely survive while in this situation, but you need to thrive. You need to seek the welfare of the city. And by the way, this is the Babylonian city, right? A wicked city, a dominant city. And yet they are to seek the welfare of that city and pray for that city, for that government, for that community, for that kingdom to the Lord. And so my second point is this very simply, that we as exiles, we need to flourish in Babylon. We need to not only do uh, the things that we want to do, but we need to do the things that we need to do so that we can continue on and we can actually thrive and flourish in the midst of our exile. So think about this. How do you flourish in Babylon? Even in our current quarantine, what are the ways that you can flourish? What are the ways that you can remain to be fruitful? I know that one of those ways that I can flourish is by being of help to others. You know, many of us are, are, are right now so accustomed to the negativity on social media. You have people, you know, voicing out their, their complaints, all of these um, this negativity online and you know what for you to flourish you need to find a way for you to be helpful instead of just becoming another negative voice right so so for many of us a way to be fl to, to flourish in our exile is to uh, find ways that we can be of help I know of many many people who during this time have really helped those in need the frontliners they provided PPEs they provided goods for those who are uh, working even during this time for grocery clerks for security admin personnel their condominiums they're doing so many things to continue to cultivate and flourish during these times how about you see when we are in the midst of an exile we are called to seek the welfare of our nation to seek the welfare of our city and to seek the welfare even of our own households how are you contributing to that? You see, part of being faithful in the exile is flourishing where we are planted, blooming and growing where God has designated us to be. You see, he's telling his people, even in Babylon, you need to flourish there. 
you need to continue with living and you need to continue to be of good use of valuable effectiveness even in your exile what's our message for today yes god is a promise keeper in the midst of any situation you find yourself in and god calls us to be faithful in exile now a third aspect of our message for today is what we read in Jeremiah 29, verse 8 to 9. And it says this, The Lord continues in his message to the exiles in Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners, these are people who, who, who extend messages, divine oracles, divine messages, who are among you, deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream, in verse 9, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. So what's happening here? Let's break it down. God is warning his people not to believe in the false prophets and the false diviners during their time. Why? Because we can see that Jeremiah was the chosen prophet of God for his people. There were other prophets that Jeremiah was to to constantly oppose because they were sharing not the messages of God but their own messages there were actually people during Jeremiah's time prophets who were saying no 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 the Babylonians will not capture us God will protect us well did that happen no the Babylonians conquered Israel and in fact God later on declares that he has groomed and he has prepared Nebuchadnezzar to be his instrument of judgment for Israel, right? How can you imagine that? Now, even here, God is calling his people not to believe in the false truths. Don't let them deceive you, for they are a lie. What is the lie that God is trying to tell them not to believe? Well, it's for this lie that was being told by the, prof the false prophets that they were in the exile for only a short period of time that they will be there for a few weeks, a few months, a few years, and that they cannot live and thrive in Babylon, but that God will return them surely, quickly, back to their land, back to Israel. Well, did that happen? No. So our third point for today is this, don't believe the fake news. We need to practice discernment, right? In the same way that the exiles were called by God not to believe these false prophets, prophets who were claiming that they will return immediately back to their land okay that wasn't true because God knew that the Israelites were to stay longer in Babylon in fact the next verses show just how long they would stay in exile I see for many of us fake news comes so easily right now there are so many messages that bombard us on our social media, on the news, and we are just bombarded with lies and deception everywhere. But as the people of God, we have discernment. We have to choose to discern with what is from God and what is from the world. Now, for, for our personal application as well, um, there are plenty of fake news out there, not just pertaining to our current situation, but pertaining to the plans of God. People will say and, and tell all of these things that God uh, wants to give you right now, health, wealth, and happiness, right? That, that if you believe in Jesus, that you will have perfect health, many riches, and that you will have all of these things given unto you. We call that in modern day language, prosperity gospel where you follow God because you want to get something from Him. Where you follow God, you name it and you claim it, and then suddenly God provides you with whatever you want. Now, there is a half-truth there because we don't always get what we want because God only gives us what we need. What is in accordance to His will, what, is in, what will give Him the ultimate glory and not us. You see, we have to be vigilant against all of these fake news, including fake gospels out there who are claiming that we will have health, wealth, and prosperity just because we follow Jesus. Was that true for the exiles? They were the people of God, and yet God still allowed them this moment of tribulation and persecution in exile 
so that they can cling on to God more closely. You see, don't believe the fake news when it strikes. Be discerning. Seek the Word of God to find the truths that you can rely on. You see, the Word of God is timely. It always is for us and it's timeless. In every season, in every situation, it's applicable to us. Timely and timeless. That is the Word of God. That is our foundation of how we can know the basis of truth from the lies, from what is from God and what is deceiving from the enemy. And so, with the next few verses, Jeremiah 29 verse 10 says this, For thus says the Lord, How long will their exile be? Look, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, my people, I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. He will bring back his people back to the promised land, back to Israel after how long? Not two years as the fake prophets say. After 70 years. Wow, that's a tough message to receive. That for seven for the next 70 years i will be stuck here in exile that is god's way of reaching out to his people who are stubborn who disobeyed him and who are unfaithful to him and so he uses this exile so that he can show his people that he loves them he wants the best for them but he also disciplines them out of his own love you see, after 70 years, God was true to His promises and God fulfilled this word because after 70 years, mind you, the Israelites returned back to Israel. And we see the fourth point of our message for today that we, upon not believing the fake news around there, upon us flourishing in Babylon, upon us having a, a good frame of mind that we can experience God's fulfilled promises that we can experience every promise that he has said and it will come to pass let me just show you how God fulfilled his promise that he is our promise keeper you see during the Babylonian Empire they were conquered uh, around 600 BC uh, 687 BC, I think, that's where the Babylonian invaded Israel, deported all of the people. And a few years later, the Babylonian Empire was destroyed and taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire. And this is the empire that allowed the Jews to come back to their land. Imagine, after 70 years of being exiled in Babylon, another kingdom... Okay? The Medo-Persian kingdom under the leadership of King Cyrus. Okay? We read about this guy again in Daniel, uh, in the book of Daniel, right? Around 538 BC, the Jews are once again allowed to come back to their land. What is the proof of this? Well, we see this from Ezra chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. Let me just read it for you all. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, he's the leader, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. You see, God fulfilled his promise through the prophet Jeremiah. Look, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. What did he say? Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven. Wow, he even attributes the God of heaven, the Israelites' God, Yahweh, and says, that this God has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah. Wow, amazing promise, right? That Cyrus is fulfilling right before Ezra's eyes. And verse 3 continues, Whoever is among you of his people, meaning the Israelites, the Jews, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Amazing time. In fact, this is around the same time that Nehemiah, the governor, was sent back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of the temple. And further, in verse 4, and let each survivor, my bonus path, 
in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of his place with silver, gold, with goods, with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. You see, after the exile, God permitted his people to go back to the land that was promised to them by God. And not only that, they will have, they will have supplies. They will have their resources to be able to go back to their land. You see, God is a promise-keeping God that despite these wicked empires of the Babylonians and even the Medo-Persians, he was not yet done there. We see two more kingdoms under the Greek Empire that God was still in the background. He was orchestrating everything. Why? Because after the Persian Empire, a great guy, we know him from the history books, Alexander the Great, comes in, conquers the entire known world, right? He brings with him the Greek culture, the Greek language, right? And that sets up the stage for what we are about to discuss in just a few moments. After the Greek Empire, where the Greek culture and the Greek language are brought to the world as one language, you know, many of the people during those days would speak in Greek, okay? After that, the Roman Empire arose. And the Roman Empire was known for the roads that they built, for the system of trade paving the way for massive information, dissemination, and trade all across the known entire ancient world. And we see these two world kingdoms being used by God to further His promises that He indeed has a plan for His people, plans for their welfare, not to harm them, plans for a future and a hope. You see, amidst the world kingdoms in history, God is a promise keeper. And our message for today is what? Because God is our promise keeper, be faithful in exile. Be faithful in exile. So we now see how God was faithful even in the midst of Israel's exile in Babylon. That after 70 years had happened, they would be returned to their own land. Now how does this relate to us? Well, you see folks, we are all exiles in this world. We are all exiled to live in this earth, to live in captivity, to live in, quote-unquote, our modern-day Babylon, where we yearn for something more. That while we are in captivity, there is something that God is preparing for us, something that is beyond our imagination, something that is beyond even our thinking. Many of us have been accustomed to this term, the new normal that nothing will ever be the same after this quarantine period. You see, many of us, we can't go back to normal. We realize that normal can be taken away from us in an instant. We had all of our plans, we had all of our goals during 2020, the start of this year, and yet everything can change in one moment. But let me tell you this, when you believe that God is indeed a promise keeper, that he is true to his word. You cannot just live a new normal. You cannot just live as if after all of these things, you can you know, do whatever it is that you did before. But God is calling all of us to live not the new normal, but above normal. What do I mean by above normal? That instead of living a new normal, we are called to live different. We are called to live extraordinary. We are called to live supernaturally. We are called to live set apart from the ways of this world. You see, we are all in exile today because this world that we see in front of us is not the world that was prepared for us. That's why we live above normal. What do I mean by this? Look, Ephesians 2, 18 verse 19 says this, For through Him, this is Jesus now. Fast forward thousands of years, 600, 500, 400 years after the captivity, after exile in Babylon, Jesus now comes into the picture and Paul the Apostle shares in Ephesians that through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit 
to the Father. And he says this in verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You're no longer exiles. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In other words, he's trying to tell us that because of what Jesus came to do, we are now no longer exiles, but we are brought in. We are citizens, fellow citizens of the household of God. Colossians 3 verse 20 to 21 says this, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him to be sub- even to subject all things to Himself. You see, my bottom line point is, We are currently in exile and we are awaiting to return to our home, our real home. That despite living our lives right here and now, we know that we are meant to be somewhere else. You know, C.S. Lewis said this in Mere Christianity. I love this quote so much. And he says this, that if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation, he says, is that I was made for another world. You see, you can try to seek for satisfaction in this world. You can try to seek all the power, the relationships, the money, the career, all of these things. But in the end, it will not satisfy you because you were made for another world. Your home is not ultimately in this world, but your home is in the world to come. And my point is, as we wind down our time here together that we cannot stay in exile and live as if this is our only home we have to await the home that jesus prepared for us in fact this week is a is the holy week and we see jesus's words to his own disciples in john 14 verse 1 to 3 and this are his words to his disciples before he goes to the cross And he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And he says this beautiful line. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And look at this. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. See, ultimately, this week, this Holy Week, we commemorate how Jesus came to this earth, got out of His own heavenly abode, how He condescended to us, how He was, quote-unquote, exiled from heaven to be here on earth, to walk among us, to dwell among us, that though He was God, He became flesh and dwelt among us ultimately to prepare a place for us. Not here, but in heaven with the Father. He has come to prepare us for our real home. And that is why we call it Good Friday. You see, if we look back at the historical and even the gospel accounts, Friday is not good. Why? Because Friday is the day after the week of the Passion of Christ, how He lived that last week before being crucified, is this, that He was nailed to that cross after severely being flogged, being beaten, being bruised and bloodied, after they they put a crown of thorns mockingly on His head, after they clothed him with a robe of purple linen to mock him in jest, how they stripped him naked, how they mocked him, how they allowed him to go through a mock trial, how he was condemned to death unjustly, and how at the very end of that day he was crucified and nailed on that cursed tree, on that bloodied cross. You see, Jesus is the ultimate exile. From heaven, He came to earth. He took on flesh. 
And even in Matthew 8, 20, he says that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Even while he was walking on this earth 2,000 years ago, he did not have a place to live in. And Jesus, as our ultimate exile, as Hebrews 13 says, he was crucified outside the city. Outside of the city. He was excluded, he was rejected, and he was cast out so that you and I could be brought in. You see, Hebrews 13, 11 to 12 says this, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. What is he referring to? He is referring to the sacrificial offering for sin. How it was a bloody mess. The people of Israel were called to sacrifice an unblemished lamb as a sacrifice for their sin. The lamb would be, uh, would be cut open. The blood would be the atonement for the covering of our sins. That's how they did it in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. Only to point to a future reality of when, finally, the Lamb of God, Jesus, would come into the picture and He would give His life for the sins of the world, who takes away the sins of the world. And verse 12 says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through His own blood. And therefore, let us go to Him outside the camp and bear the reproach that He endured. For where, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. You see, when we look at Friday, there's nothing good about it. It is that Jesus was crucified on our behalf for us sinners. He was placed outside of the city. And there, the gruesome sight of the cross, where Jesus bled and died, where he was ultimately excluded and where he paid for our sins only to point us that this world is not our home that he died in order to pay for our sins and to bring us to the father that is why he says i am the truth i am the way and i am the life that is why jesus says i am the resurrection and the life because after being murdered on that cross after being buried after three days, he rose again, signifying that whoever believes in him, it is they who have forgiveness of sins, it is they who have eternal life. And so, how can we be faithful in exile? It is because of this truth, that Jesus was the original exile. He was exiled, he was brought out of the city so that we can be brought into the city of God. He was excluded so that we could be included. And ultimately, Jeremiah 29, 11, the only fulfillment of this verse is the plan of God for salvation for those who would trust and believe in Jesus Christ. You see, that's how we can be faithful in our exile with our frame of mind, when we set our mind to the plan of God, how we sent Jesus at the reality, at the fullness of time. I, I shared this earlier with you, that during the Greek Empire, the language of the Greeks was the most widely spoken language. And that is why we have bulk of the New Testament written in what? Greek. And that is why during the Roman Empire, they built the road so that people, messengers can relay the information. Why? Because we see now that God is a promise-keeping God. That at the fullness of time, Jesus died and He rose again. And therein we find the good news, the gospel, which was communicated in Greek, which was disseminated through the Roman roads all across the world so that we would come to know of this plan of God for our lives. That we can flourish even in Babylon, even right now in exile, 
while we await Jesus, we can flourish, we can thrive, we can do our part. And because of what Jesus did, we don't have to believe the fake news. We don't have to believe in all of this humanistic, therapeutic, all of these messages to you know, actualize or fulfill yourself, your desires that it's all about you. No, we realize all of that is fake news. That's not about us. It's about God. It's about Jesus Christ himself. And we can discern the things that are true based on his word. And finally, that we can experience fulfilled promises of God. You see, the reason why we can only call it Good Friday is because it is good for us that Jesus died for our sins in our place. Because if Jesus had not done that, we will not have access, we will not have entry into the presence of a holy and righteous God. That's why we call it good. In closing, I want to share this quote with you. You may have heard this once before. It is this, if it is not yet good, that means God is not yet done. If it is not yet good, God is not yet done. And ultimately, I share that with you because today is Good Friday. Why do we call it good? Because this is the day that Jesus said, It is done. I have finished the work that I have come to do here. It is done. Therefore, it is good. I close you with these two aspects of my message. The first is a truth. The second is a question. And I want to share this with you because this is where we reflect upon this message now. The truth is, Jesus is alive. He died and He rose again. He ascended to the Father. And someday soon, He will come again. He will return for us, His people, those who follow Him, those who are faithful even in the exile. He will return for us because He is a promise keeper. Jesus is alive. And the question that I want to leave you with is this. Is Jesus alive in you? Is Jesus alive in your life, in your mind, in your heart, in the very way that you live, in the very way that you behave? Is Jesus alive and real in your life? See, the only reason that we can be faithful even now as we await our eternal home in the presence of God is because Jesus is our promise keeper. Ultimately, in Him, we have fulfilled Jeremiah 29, 11, that God indeed has a plan for us, and that is to come into a relationship with Jesus, and that His plans are not for our harm, not so that we can suffer eternal punishment in hell apart from the presence of God, but it's for our welfare so that we would be enabled to enter and to have access to God the Father through the mediator who is Jesus Christ. Ultimately, that is His plan for our welfare, our hope, and our future. Therefore, we can be faithful in exile. While we await Jesus, or maybe even before we come to Him, we can be faithful here and now. I hope that this message has spoken to you and I pray that you will reflect upon this as we go through the next few days, Good Friday, Saturday, and finally, Resurrection Sunday. And as we see in the, the final song, is Jesus. Lord, you give us the heart of worship. Maaari takot kami, Panginoon. Maaari nag-aala kami matatapuan ba kami ng virus, Panginoon? O ano man sakit? But help us, Father, to give us the heart of worship. And as we sing this song, let's offer our lives. Let's offer our hearts. 
When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to ring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you, I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself, it's not what you had required. You search, you search much deeper within. The way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming, I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about. You. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus, thank you, Lord. King of endless worth. King of endless worth. No one can express how much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you I'll bring you more than a song For a song in its not what you have required. You search much. You search much deeper within. Though the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I together now Heavenly Father we come before you knowing that we are exiles in this land in this world today that we are living in our own version of Babylon a wicked kingdom a wicked world full of sin suffering and sorrow but Lord we know that our time here is temporary and that soon after 
you will again bring us back to our eternal home and that is with you in your presence so lord as we await your return as we await in captivity as we live our lives here with a proper frame of mind as we flourish in babylon as we do not believe the fake news and as we await your fulfilled promises in our lives we want to be faithful to you so lord i pray for anyone who is hearing this message today that maybe they realize man i was after god for everything that he can give me my desires my wants all of these plans that i have for myself but instead today they have come to realize that god's plan is entirely different that our welfare our future and our hope are ultimately tied to none other than jesus christ i pray that today they would consider that jesus is indeed the lord and king and master of their lives and that we would all surrender our lives to you lord jesus we thank you that on that cross 2000 years ago you died for our sins, all of our sins, past, present, and future. And not only that, you gave us your righteousness, your perfect, sinless life for our wicked, cursed life. And in exchange, you gave us everlasting life. Father, we trust in what Jesus has done, and that is why we call it Good Friday, because it is done as Jesus exclaimed on the cross so may we trust his finished work today may we come into a personal and intimate relationship with him today and i pray that many today will come to be saved redeemed and considered welcome into the household of god where we are fellow citizens of heaven where we await our soon and coming king jesus christ Thank you, Lord. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. For our discussion uh, and reflection points, I want to uh, ask you to consider two things. Number one, because of what Jesus did, right? How he was the ultimate exile for us so that we can be integrated into the community, into the family, into the kingdom of God. How can I be faithful in exile? And I want you to think about this in really specific, um, actionable terms. How can I be faithful while I am on this earth, while I am in exile here, while I am awaiting the return of Jesus, or while I am awaiting coming home to Him in His presence? How can I be faithful here and now? And a close second question to that would be, which aspects in my life can I improve on in my own journey? We talked about our frame of mind which deals with our perspective maybe you've, you've you, your perspective or frame of mind has recently been confused or maybe you're struggling with doubts or, or number two how can you improve in flourishing in Babylon how can you improve in being fruitful and productive even during this quarantine period um, number three maybe a certain aspect of how you can improve on is discerning the fake news and disbelieving all of those lies the deception that we are faced with on a day-to-day -day basis you know or maybe fourth is how has god fulfilled his promises in your life and how can you rely on those promises you see in, in the word of god there are many promises that he has laid maybe you can share with your group or on social media how any of these things you have experienced has really led to build your faith to become more faithful while in exile. I pray that uh, your discussion with your group will be a blessing to you and God bless.